My name is Lacey Leone McLaughlin. This is Unfolding Leadership. Melanie Bender's experience spans two decades of leading purpose-driven businesses, acquiring industry accolades, including Fast Company's Most Creative People, WWD's Beauty Vanguard, Glossy's 50, Beauty Independence Brand Builder of the Year, and among many others. Starting at Who, What, Where as VP of Marketing and Brand Development, she helped build a $150 million annual retail business. Next, she was the founding president of Verst, which under her leadership became the number one clean skincare brand in mass channels. Most recently, she was the CEO of Rode, a minimalist skincare brand that's been awarded Allure's Best of Beauty, Beauty Inc.'s Newcomer of the Year Award in 2022, and already ranks in the top 10 most talked about skincare brands on social media, all in the first year of her leading the business. I am so excited to talk leadership. Welcome to the program, Melanie. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you, Lacey. Yeah. So before we jump into some of the conversation around leadership, talk to me and tell our guests a little bit about who you are and how you got into what you're doing today. Yeah. Um, I, I jokingly, but seriously, like to say, I, I got into what I'm doing, which is um, currently the, the CEO of Rode, um, this amazing company in skincare founded by Haley Bieber. Uh, and I got here today, not through the front door, not through a back door, but through like a, a side window, three floors up, um, because I, I have a very unconventional background for, for what I do today. And it was admittedly a, a long and at times difficult journey to get here. I grew up in Hawaii in a, a little town called Kailua and studied sustainability and aerospace engineering in college. So very different than, than what I'm doing today. Um, Quite I started the shift. Working, yes, <laughs> slightly, slightly. Um, started working in the field of sustainability, getting out of college, moved to New York doing that and, and had kind of a, a quarter life crisis realizing that while well, parts of my uh, my brain and and um, interests were fed, big parts weren't. Uh, and it was then that I started shifting to fashion and beauty and getting really excited in what those were as these very consumer, emotional, and um, you know optimistic industries and fields. Um, but I recognize I had the completely wrong <laughs> background to get any of the jobs I was interested in. And on top of that, I had no contacts. I didn't have you know any of the the ins that you typically go through. So it took a lot of just frankly um, hustle and getting my resume out there. And uh, a lot of, you know, not my dream jobs, but jobs that got me one step closer and one step closer. And I feel like I was in that mode for a, a good decade and, you know, finally started to see more of the opportunities that I think, you know, were my, my dream job. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful for the, the path that took me here. Yeah, it is. And it is an adventure. And it also just reminds, uh, hopefully it reminds our listeners that we might start out in one place. And we do that when we're very early on in our career. And we uh, should expect or remember that we can end up in a very, very different place. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was just a really, a really key learning that at the time, I don't think I made space for. I think I I felt a lot of pressure to know exactly where I was going to end up and for life to be as I expected. And my dad is this incredible um, marine biologist who is a, a has a PhD and has done amazing work. And I think I I thought, all right, I follow in his footsteps. That's what took me to to science and engineering. And it was a very humbling experience to realize that what I thought was right for my life and where I thought I belonged, you know, is no longer where I see that. Uh, and it's scary to start from scratch uh, and to not know whether you will be welcomed and, and find your place in those new areas. But ultimately, I think when you free yourself up to continue changing your idea of who you want to be and what you want to do is ultimately where you find those really interesting opportunities. And if I, you know, reflect back, like it served me incredibly well because in industries that are changing and, and are evolving, you actually want people with with different and and varied backgrounds. And by continuing to go after areas that you're curious about or excited about, I think that's ultimately where you uncover those hot spots of innovation and positions you ahead of maybe everyone else that that had more of that traditional or, or cookie cutter background. Yeah. When you think about your willingness to go through this evolution and this journey to get to this thing that inspired and motivated and energized you, that's hard. What are you most proud of in terms of everything you had to do to get to where you are today? I think, you know, the moments that I am most proud of, I think, you know, obviously I've been able to do 
you know, really phenomenal things like worse was my, my last brand, which I developed from, from, from pre everything really from inception and, and built into the number one clean skincare brand at mass. Um, so huge milestones, but really the moments that I've always carried with me the most are the, the times that I had building community with people. And I think a few moments of those that stand out, I think, you know, at, at first, um, those first early months of seeing just this incredible success at Target, you know, one of the largest beauty retailers in, um, in the country and looking around the table and seeing just this small group of young women <laughs> and realizing what we had built together, that we had built a brand, that we had built a business, that we had you know, really started changing the culture around um, access to to good skincare and, and cleaner ingredients. I think that was just an incredibly gratifying experience um, because it does feel at times like an industry that has been very corporate or, or male dominated. Um, so that's one thing that I've really cherished. I, I still very acutely remember my first day with my my team here at Road. Um, I think first days are always memorable. And when you're a CEO, the first day is just as scary as you know when you're coming in in a in a in a different position. And I remember that first lunch that we had sitting down together and there was maybe seven of us at the time. And feeling that community start to build, feeling that, um, you know, that incredible shared spirit that you have when you are, are building something together. And, and that was just so, so meaningful to me. Uh, and then a, a more recent one, Fortune did a, a really lovely write up on me. <laughs> I read it. It was Recently. amazing. Yeah. And I had done just a little post about it onto my LinkedIn and, you know, really just wanted to talk about hey, this is an amazing highlight real moment that is so layered to me because of all the failure and learnings and challenges that got me there. And that LinkedIn post went on to reach over 230,000 people, which to me just blew my mind, probably more than the original article itself reached. And to me, knowing that people were finding community and, you know, hopefully some, some learning and motivation in my own challenges um, and experiences just meant so much to me because I think at, at the times that I was going through each of those things that I was talking about, I felt very alone in it. Mm -hmm. And that's a great transition to where you are today, which is the top leader in a brand and an organization, which can also be very lonely. Yes, I am aware. <laughs> I, will, I will be honest that I have, um, I found such great community in this role and I do what I do in large part because of the people and being able to share those experiences. And that's, you know, community with a, a team, you know, right now we're a little bit over 20 people and um, it's an incredible size to know that you're every thing that you achieve and do, you know, you're, you're doing it with this small group of, of really passionate and committed folks. Um, but also the community that I've been able to find with other CEOs and founders and, and brand leaders has been just incredible. And I don't know if it's like this in, in every industry, but I have a text chain with probably 20 other CEOs and founders that I just respect and admire um, in spades. And we'll share everything from, you know, legal <laughs> counsel, uh, attorneys, uh, recommendations to, you know, how we're dealing with different situations. And, and sometimes it's just celebrating each other if we see an amazing article about someone um so you know it's it, it's there's you're the only one in the job at your company um absolutely and you are responsible for you know solving the problems that come up but at the same time i think if you open yourself to to sharing those experiences with other people i have been just blown away and in love with the community that i've built from it yeah you have always been um someone i think that has a really great balance in terms of how you spend your time, how you think about where your time is most impactful and so on and so forth. For those leaders that struggle to build a network, to str that struggle to be a build a community because their heads are down, they're doing the job. What advice do you have for them? <laughs> and I, I would put myself in that, in that camp. Um, because I would, I'm 100% an introvert. I don't really go to networking events. It's just not my thing. Um, and I think for years I had assumed that because of that, I wouldn't build a network. Um, and I think what I have, what's worked for me is opening myself up to 
you know, finding people through whatever ways that they pop up organically. If I happen to be, you know, at an event, you know, I loved getting to to meet folks that way. I've also just been introduced through mutual friends with other founders. And I think once you, I found, you know, once you find a, a few people that are those kindred spirits and, you know, are similar roles and similar companies. Um, once you start with one, I think, you know, everyone has their own community and maybe I only know four people, but those four people each know four people. And to me, that's how I've been, um, how I've built some of those most amazing relationships. And I think the other thing that was just a real unlock for me is when I led the Code Red for Climate Initiative, which um, I led back in 2021 and collectively brought together over 200 brands to advocate for um, some much needed climate climate reform from our elected officials. Uh, it was something that I I did out of really a feeling of of, of need. Um, and through that process of putting myself out there and saying, hey, I don't have all the answers, but I have some of them. <laughs> Do you guys want to come together on that? Um, I think I I made myself very vulnerable um, and stuck my, you know, my neck out in a way that I think wasn't maybe so so typical in terms of putting a kind of crazy idea out there and inviting other people to join me on it. And I came out of that with, um, I think, both a lot of amazing relationships that I've built, but also with a lot more comfort in who I am um, and that that is welcome and belongs here in beauty, which again, you know, because of this kind of crazy background that I've had, I think I, in, in, in earlier times, I didn't always feel comfortable in the room. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So when you're thinking back to that initiative and you're like, I should do this and it's needed and it's going to be a lot and maybe it's a little bit of a crazy idea and maybe it's something that hasn't been done before. How did you get yourself to take the first step? <laughs> you know, and that's exactly it. All you have to do is take one step. And that's what what any of those big accomplishments break down into. And that started with a text message to another founder. Um, and I think, you know, what I recognize is that I should do something. Mm. <laughs> and I think I was maybe looking for reasons not to ensure the fact that I had a full time job and a family <laughs> at home were excellent reasons to, to not take on more commitments. Um, but it started with, hey, I'm just going to put the idea out there. And when he shuts it down, I will go on my way. But he didn't shut it down. He said, yeah, you know, we, we should do something. Um, and then we each reached out to two people that we knew. And those people all said yes. And at the point that, you know, I had five brands that were signed on to it, you know, that was enough. That was the critical mass. And I, my goal at the time was to make it over the finish line with 20. Then when we went past 200, it was, you know, absolutely staggering. Um, so I think, you know, yeah, you start somewhere and be open to how it unfolds. And that is how the biggest journeys are, uh, are accomplished with just taking that one step at a time. Right, right. So a lot of leadership there. When you think about leadership in the initiative, when you think about leadership in your last company, this company, we recognize that it comes with lots of bumps and bruises. We recognize that it is hard. What do you think are the some of the biggest challenges that have gotten in your way from a leadership perspective? Yeah, um, it is it is hard. Um, incredibly rewarding, <laughs> but hard. And I think, you know, one of the things that for me personally, I know has been a, a challenge is that negativity bias, which is a very universal human um, trait of focusing just a lot more on the negative and the positive. And it's this incredible survival mechanism that, you know, back in the tundra, I'm sure made a ton of sense. Um, but what it means that kept us you know, alive. Exactly, exactly. But we're not, we're, you know, we're not fighting for our lives now. And, you know, I think what that means for um, for folks in, in a role like mine, you're inundated with feedback. And if, if you're doing your job right, there's going to be a lot of positive. But no matter what, there's going to be, you know, the constructive that's helping you see where you can do more, what those opportunities are. And when you lean into that negative negativity bias, you become just consumed with the things that you can do better and, you know, what what other folks might have said, think, feel um, so for me, that's been just a really important thing to to recognize because I do have high expectations about, you know, what um, what, what I want to deliver and and what I want to see the the businesses that I take on deliver. And I choose companies that I think have just almost unlimited potential, and that leads to uh, the inevitability of there's always going to be a list of things to get to and things to improve. Um, so just 
being able to identify that a little bit when my mind is going in that way and, um, you know, really assessing, all right, am I focusing in on these things because there's nothing positive to think about? Um, and almost always that's not the case. Um, so celebrating those wins, whether they're they're big or small, um, and creating space to think about those opportunities in a constructive and empowering way, which usually is filling them down to priorities and plans. Um, and ultimately accepting that doing the job well doesn't mean doing every single thing that comes through. It means doing the big, important things well. Yeah. Um, and how do you identify the big, important things? What does it look like? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think um, I think that's a, a a place that feedback is key. And I've my my um, most recent roles, I haven't been the founder. I've had an incredible founder partner. I recognize that it's not just what I think uh, is big as and is important, but it's also input from founders, input from the team who will see different opportunities and and will see different risks and challenges. So you know, I think. I always go back to vision and what are we looking to accomplish and where do we have a disruptive opportunity to, um, you know, drive something in a way that no one else can. What are our unfair advantages? It's always something that I, I love to look for and, and really think about where we're positioned to lead and, and, and act in a way that no one else can. But ultimately, I want to be asking that question to everyone around me, because chances are they're going to have amazing input that I didn't think of. They are also critical folks coming along in that journey. So want them to be brought into the thinking and, and the planning behind those priorities. Excellent. Excellent. So being in your last two roles as the CEO of founder created organizations, how do you reconcile running the business and bringing a vision to life of these of these individuals who created this thing. Such a great question, and I um, am grateful to have a, a number of you know friends and, and community members who are in similar roles. And I think you know when it's done right, it's this beautiful collaborative relationship where neither person has to be thinking and um, and, and driving everything. And I think for me, it's been most uh, rewarding and exciting when that person, they bring the vision, they bring the mission, you know, they bring that creative beating heart. Um, the brands that I've built and that I've loved being a part of are always the brands with a soul. And I think you, you can tell, right, when when there's a brand that, you know, really has that, um, that je ne sais quoi, that, 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 that feeling of, um, of true groundedness in, um, in vision and mission. And to me, that's an incredible thing that comes from the right founder partner. It's something that I feed off of. And I, I've always joked a little bit about myself that I get distracted by the shiny objects, <laughs> like the little kitten. Um, so having someone who is really grounding that, that compass, and this is where we're going. And this is why to me is just an incredible unlock that lets me go at hyperspeed and know that I'm going in the the place that I want to end up. Yeah. It's so fascinating because as a consumer, which anything that you put your um, passion energy to, I will buy. We've learned that. Um, there's no going <laughs> wrong with supporting anything that you're putting out into the world. Uh, but as a consumer, I will say that it always feels bigger. The things that you're driving, the the, the products that you're putting forward, um, it feels bigger than just the product. So I think that that helps me hear that how, sort of how you bring it to life, because I get that as somebody who is consuming what you put into the world. So that's awesome. Well, thank you. And to me, that's the beauty of the people behind the products. And it is, you know, again, you can't can't put your finger on it, but you can tell when there's love and passion and, and thought and, and intention. And I can't imagine working for a company that doesn't have that because it's so much of the reward. And to me, that's also just one of the great joys in, in finding beauty at a, as an industry, because we are this industry of of culture, but also of, of hope. And we don't just accept the world as it is. We're constantly challenging and, and pushing it forward in, in different ways. Um, and to me, that's where I've just found that that place of, of joy and creation of, you know, putting products out there that I love, that I love to put on my skin and, and wear all day. Um, but also that I know are, are pushing culture and, and society, just that little half step closer to, to how we want to see it. Yeah. And you mentioned that in the very beginning of our conversation that you were creating teams and thinking about doing some things in the industry that weren't 
very commonplace. How have you found navigating that? Because the things that you have done since I've been following your career have been pretty stinking big and pretty, pretty stinking successful but not necessarily easy and very different to the industry. Yeah. And I would say I was never really great at following, <laughs> following the expected and, and rote paths. Um, and I remember those early days of, of being in, you know, the, the work that I was doing in sustainability at the time. And just, I, I couldn't shake the feeling of there is something here to explore and do. And that's how I would describe it. I think it's, it's not easy to to take, you know, kind of the the less trodden paths and to break from the pack and, um, you know, be essentially be a challenger. Whether you're challenging um, values, whether you're challenging how products are made, um, it's it's tough. And I think there's inherent friction down those paths. But for me, it's always been an unshakable desire and curiosity to find what's at the other end of it. And, um, you know, as I've gone through those types of roles and, and journeys more, I'm, I feel like I've, I've just learned so much about how you de-risk those paths um, and, you know, really continue to, to challenge and have disruptive visions and, and goals. Yeah. So when you think about potential listener who is either has this idea or wants to redefine an industry or is thinking about being a founder and they know they need to challenge what's been done before, or they need to redefine how their work and their industry has been done. How do they start? And I know you talked about first steps before, but what is the advice you have to the person that's, you know, 15 years earlier in their career and thinking about being that disruptor? Yeah, such a great question. And I think to me, what what you're looking for is the intersection of, you know, what is the the goal and vision that you want to take on and what are those unfair advantages that you have? And that will lead you to a very specific starting point. And I think, you know, in general, when you have those huge plans and visions, it starts very specific. You don't take on the world overnight. So don't feel like you need to address everything with the first initiative or the first launch or even the first vision deck. Know that it is a a stepping stone process to get from, let's say, the first pair of eyeglasses you launched to Warby Parker. Um, mm-hmm. So really letting yourself think big and know where you want to get to, but also pushing yourself to get specific and um, get really realistic in how you start taking those steps. And also really pushing yourself to think about what are your strengths? What are your, the idea of onlyness? What are the things that only you can do that only you bring? And those things together, I think, point to that, that winning end zone, at least for the, the first thing that you take on. Yeah. If I break that down for myself, it's almost like think big, start small, know the value that you add. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that last one is critically important because there are things that I have done that, you know, other amazing leaders couldn't have taken on because they didn't have some of the background and knowledge and and vice versa. So not getting caught up in who other people are, what other people have done. Sure, learn from them. Learn from, you know, what's worked for them. Learn from their challenges because there will be that. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, get really informed and, and real about the strengths and um, advantages that you bring. And that's what you want to be building for. Yeah, I love that you think about this as sort of a human, right? So, so often I work with leaders and they've read this leadership book or this leadership philosophy, or they want to emulate this leader who founded this company. And they think because that person had success or that model had success or that book is insightful, this is what I should be doing. But often it's the conversation around how do we bring this back, make it your own and think about who you are and how you want to show up. And that sounds like something that's just been really clear for you from day one. I completely agree with, with, with how you frame that. And, you know, I I don't think it's always been, been clear. I think it's part of the the learning journey. And I remember, you know, earlier on in in my career, sitting down and having my amazing leader at the time speaking to the whole company. And I remember looking back up at her and thinking, I'm I'm just, I'm never going to be as inspiring as she is. I just, I don't know how I ever, how I ever get to that. And, it was true that I was never going to be her. <laughs> but what I think I wasn't leaving space for at the time is who could I be? 
And by, again, by letting myself lead naturally where I have strengths and passion, I found those areas. And it is, again, this kind of just area of flow that you get into of, you don't know it's where, where it's going a hundred percent of the time, but you know that you're in the right place. You know that you're, you know, pushing boundaries forward. You know that you're finding this place of amazing growth and curiosity and contribution. And that's what I've naturally found with time. Um, but it, it, it took, it took a lot of learning and openness to be able to, to see that path for myself. Yeah. I, who could I be and how do I lead naturally? How did you create the space to go through that discovery? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think I have always gravitated towards mindfulness and intentionality. I've never been a huge leadership book person. And I think it's it's because it does create a comparison that, you know, if you're reading a leadership book, it's, it's pro- probably because you're not yet identifying yourself as a leader. Um so instead, by just creating time and space for me to naturally reflect, and I think, yes, looking for tools. I love tools, ways of thinking, exercises to go through. Um, and by applying those regularly, if it's, you know, the end of the day for me, I'm just a big kind of journaling and, and writing person um, in the evenings. I think that's been helpful. But but frankly, it also has come a lot from from the community and from knowing incredible people like you, Lacey, and the the women that we've gotten to know, I think um, we're always our harshest critic. And one of the great pieces of advice out, advice out there is, you know, say to yourself what you would say to your best friend. And it's just so wildly different than the narrative that's typically running through our heads. Um, and by having enough community with the right people, I think it's opened me to you know, maybe uh, stop challenging myself a, a little bit and see myself as as other people do for those little milliseconds of time, <laughs> which, um, you know, is just, I think, an incredible way to reset and, you know, hopefully celebrate all that you've accomplished with, with people that you love and admire while not losing sight of, you know, everything that you still are wanting to, to make happen. Yeah. How do we hold ourselves accountable to not getting in our own way. Mm-hmm. To me, that's so right? much of it. So much of it. So much of it. And it's so interesting because the leaders that I've worked with that are, I would say, the top 10% amazing and everybody does things in their own way and there's no right or wrong or good or bad. But when I work with a leader and I go, wow, this person is the is the best at what they do in this way, right? Or is particularly good at what they do in this way. Um they're really good at holding themselves accountable and not getting in their own way by having mm-hmm. real, ex- real, realistic expectations and realistic yes. perceptions of self. Right? Yeah, yeah. Expectations are a really interesting topic as a whole, and that's also, you know, hey, it's your um, greatest asset when it causes you to, you know, aim, aim for the fences. But whether they're expectations of yourself or expectations of other people, you know, when they're set too high, I think it it really obscures what's actually out there. Um, So that's also something that, you know, I've tried to be a lot more just aware of um, certainly myself, but also, you know, with, if it's people who've managed me at times or that I've managed um, putting that perfectionist expectation on anyone is just setting them up to fail. Um, so yes, you know, you want to have, I think, in a, a high bar for, uh, for, for folks around you based on the goals that you have, but also, you know, letting everyone be human, knowing that everyone isn't going to be 100%, 100% of the time. Um, and when there is a gap, that's also an opportunity for learning, understanding, you know, hey, where, where is there, um, you know, opportunity to better support someone or, you know, are they seeing things that are different than what I was expecting? Yeah. And, and the world right now is is a hard place to be a boss. And right now the world is a hard place sort of in general. There's a lot of change happening and we'll come at it from you know, the, the positive. The cup is half full, right? And um, the environmental, social, social issues, uh, post-COVID, work from home, all of these things, plus changes in your industry, 
plus the competitive landscape, there's a lot. There is a lot happening and it's hard to be a boss. It's always been hard. I would say um, for most, it's harder now than ever. What does that look like for you? What is your sort of take on that? I know that's a big loaded question, but just in general with the world in its current state, what does that mean for you as the boss? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's just hard to be a human. I I, I don't think um, most of the circumstances that we think about, and I'm with you. Like it's culturally, um, you know, socially, you know, certainly environmentally, we're we're not in a great place. <laughs> we're <laughs> we're not where we want to be, um, and that that is not you know just confined to to my experience as a leader. And and I recognize that you know, leaders, um, they're often operating from, you know, places of, of privilege and, and support and resources. And for folks that don't have that experiencing and, and managing those same things is, is even more challenging. So to me, it's a very universal experience that um, ultimately, you know, you find community in. Um, and I've always tried to uh, be as, as open and vulnerable as, um, as I, I can with the folks that I'm interacting with, whether it's in a team environment or with my my CEO friends. And to me, there's just an incredible beauty that comes out of that. Again, for me, I break that down and say, yes, you're running a business. And yes, you have a product that you're moving forward in the market. And don't forget that we're all humans. Mm-hmm. And yeah. empathy, space, grace, all of those things is what allows us to move an organization forward. Yes. So well said. I, I, I love it. And I think it's so foundational in how you show up, uh, whether it's an article that I read about you or an opportunity to see and hear about some of the amazing things that you do. And it's important to recognize, it's important to recognize that you bring so much human to the work that you do, because I do think that's unique. Well, thank you. It means a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So on that note, though, recognizing that the world is changing, when you think about your current space, And we all want to adapt. We all want to adjust. We all want to develop. So I'm going to put you through just a quick little question. What are the things that you want to start, stop, continue when you think about you from a leadership perspective in the next, you know, two, five, 10 years? Start, stop, continue. Yeah. um, Great question. It sounds so final. (laughs) So I'm going to say I want to do, I want to do less, um, do less of I think taking things personally. I think it's when you put so much of your heart and soul into to what you do, you know, it's you feel very attached to it. And, you know, as we started out saying, hey, there's so much feedback in this role from every direction. And it's important that you hear that feedback. And when you start to identify or defend um against the feedback, you're you're going to get in the way of your learning. And ultimately, almost any of those situations that, you know, I could have taken personally, or I could have had a reaction to, it leads to two things, to either learning or forgiveness. Learning because there's a gap, there's something I wasn't seeing, there's something new out there, or forgiveness because, you know, someone had an expectation and they, they couldn't they couldn't follow through with it for, for whatever reason at that time. Um, and again, we're all human. We're all going through things and perfection does not e- exist in, in this, um, in this plane. So that's Isn't that something so that inconvenient. I, Wouldn't it be so much right? easier? If things were just easier. <laughs> I know. I know. If we could just reboot up a new, new operating system every, every yeah. time we yeah, need I know. A, I know. an upgrade. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. But I think that's always a, a constant focus. And again, I think it, it lets you just take so much more away. And, and ultimately that's the path to growth to um, letting go of all those defenses and, and seeing the, the opportunities as what they are. Um, something I'd love to do more of is, is being inspired to inspire. And that is a quote from an amazing woman that I really serendipitously met at a wedding a few weeks ago. And um, I was, you know, had a, a, a hard week at the time and she said to me, you know, Melanie, you have to be inspired to inspire. And if you're drained, if you're not, um, you know, not feeling that inspiration, no one else will. And to me that, that connected so much because that's why I want to be here. That is why I am in this role with, you know, however many people reporting into me and however many customers out there that um, I want that inspiration and that joy of creation and connection that I feel to be what they feel. 
And it could be to those same ideas and values, but it's probably going to be to different ideals and values because we each bring different um, vantage points and, and and strengths. And to me, that's what I've always seen, I think, is my purpose most that I will, um, you know, I will will have my opportunities to, to lead and hopefully contribute. Um, but even more so, I recognize the number of people that I have the ability to touch through the work that I do. And when each of us starts looking at our strengths, looking at our opportunities to influence, looking at our opportunities to support and to impact, that's when change happens. So I, I would love to do more of that, of, of being inspired to inspire. And giving ourselves the space to think about it on those days and weeks that are hard when we're tired, when we're managing family and job and all of those other things, right? That's just, um, it's just making sure we have the time and space and energy to get to a place where we can do that. As you were just speaking, something jumped out to me, which is really consistent alignment throughout your entire conversation that just goes back to intentionality. And there's just this underlying intentional component around the way you think process uh, deliberate in general. Um, it's just there from beginning to end and everything that you said, does that feel fair to you? It does. And I, I will credit my husband with that. <laughs> He's uh, we've been together for almost 20 years and he is, there's two things I love about him. One, he is, um, the goodest person I have ever met and good in the sense of just being incredibly values driven. And, um, I think it opened my eyes to looking at the world in a different way. Um, and the other thing he's amazing about is that consistency. He was a software developer by trade. <laughs> so it's a very logical builder type of um, type of mentality. And I think he's really helped me develop both that, um, that ability to, you know, be motivated by values and create my own set of values that I can come back to, but also the the joy and simplicity of that consistency and constantly coming back to it and and that's how you make those big movements that was also you know it's something that we've we've talked about that it's not about often making huge leaps it's about taking consistent steps and that starts with knowing where you want to go and you know having those motivators just to, to take that one more step As we wrap up and there are individuals listening and they want to take that first step and they're in the place where they're learning to be consistent and they're learning to be intentional, what is the first thing that they need to do to to make it happen? What, What words of advice, what words of wisdom do you have to offer for them? Yeah, such a great question. I think um, thinking about what's truly important to you, I think um, rather than what you should be or what you think you want to be. Think about what is actually important to you in whatever it is you're taking on. Is it feeling a certain way? Is it contributing in a certain area? Is it having a certain way of living? Um, Because it might lead you to a different goal than the one that you had been focused on, which certainly has been my experience. The goals that had jumped out or felt right on paper, you know, ended up not actually being the means to to, um, what was truly right in the world. So you know, think about what's, what's truly important to you. Um, and then it's always about that, that first little step. I think don't be, be daunted by where you're starting from. I think sharing that goal with someone, I've always had huge unlocks from just having a conversation, just putting something out there. I think that's a tremendous first step that can be someone who you come back to for support. It could be someone who, helps you, you know, identify or unlock something that you weren't thinking about. Um, and an- I think another great step is just journaling about it. Know how you're going to come back and check in on progress, check in on where you want to go to next. And I think you'll be amazed at how quickly you start to reflect back and see all the all the, the leaps and bounds you've made. Yeah, what great advice. What you actually care about, not what you think you should care about. Yeah. Taking action, putting it out into the world and writing it down in whatever way works for you. Thank you so much, Lacey. This conversation, as all that I've had with you, has been just a, a real pleasure. Thanks, Melanie. What I'm left with is, do you know what your true professional and personal values are? And if you do, how do you make the micro and macro more intentional around those values and alignment? And if you don't, 
What steps are you willing to take to explore and figure it out? This is Unfolding Leadership. Thanks for listening. See you on the next episode.